In this lesson, I'm going to be looking at the French Fourth and Fifth Republics. That music that I was just playing was being performed by the American uh, jazz musician uh, uh, and trumpet virtuoso Miles Davis for a film score for a famous uh, French film noir, uh, Elevator to the Gallows. And Davis would become an important figure in the French avant-garde in the late 40s and 50s. The movie poster that is shown here in this slide is promoting the film The Battle of Algiers. That is an example of cinema verite, which is another product culturally of this period. And quite groundbreaking. This film depicts in a quasi-documentary manner this savage struggle uh, as part of decolonization in Algeria. So Miles Davis's music and the cinema verite style and film are two uh, aspects of this period uh, that identify it. August 25th, 1944, liberation. This is a great day for the citizens of Paris. One of the great days in the history of the 20th century. But after the celebrations, then there's sort of, well, then what? Uh, you know, France had been humiliated in 1940. Large parts of France had collaborated between 1940 and 1944. Uh, it wasn't really uh, tenable to lock up or, or, or execute uh, all those who had in some way, uh, you know, collaborated. Though collab it depends on what type of collaboration are you talking about actively uh, searching for Jews to deport to death camps? Are you talking about low-level bureaucrats who are uh, just performing official functions? I mean, this is the the degree of collaboration, what exactly was it, you know? So these kinds of things, France either sort of had, had a choice to either, you know, sort of look very closely or after a series of, of sort of, uh, you know, unofficial acts of revenge, then you just try to move on as a country. And really it was the latter that French, the, the French uh, chose. And there's a provisional government that's in place between 1944, liberation 1944, and 1946, when the Fourth Republic is officially established. And that provisional government, uh, to no one's surprise, is led by the provisional president, Charles de Gaulle, who had tremendous stature because of his unwillingness to cooperate with the Nazis in any way, shape, or form, and leading the Free French, who then just kept gathering in strength, supported by the Allies, of course, right up to the liberation of Paris. Here's a photograph of de Gaulle. De Gaulle is, is certainly, at least politically, the dominant figure of this period. Uh, really only Francois Mitterrand as in the same sort of league as, as de Gaulle in terms of influence. But de Gaulle is, the, is really the giant politically of post-war France. He's been described by uh, historians as someone who was would have been more comfortable in the 18th century. You know, someone who was you know, serving in the court of Louis XV, you know, in the Chateau of Versailles, in terms of his his mannerisms, his tastes, his sort of, his way of dealing with people. Uh, he, he was a man out of time to a certain degree. He was not really a 20th century man. To be sure, in, in military matters, he was very much a 20th century figure. He uh, had been a pioneer in writing about mechanized warfare, which the French army ignored and the German army uh, paid careful attention to before World War II and used. 
uh, and later on, as later uh, other developments uh, come up technologically uh, regarding military matters, he shows himself to be a 20th century man. But when it comes to the, the cultural, social, even the political, he's he, he he is somewhat of an anachronism. But again, his stature was great for reasons I've already alluded to. He also his stature he was very tall. And he was the kind of tall where he had a kind of a stoop. Sometimes you'll see that with, with very tall people. They it's almost they're almost apologetic for their height and they they're constantly sort of stooping down to try to reach the level of the people that are talking to them. Uh, he loved France. He believed in the idea of France. He is in the tradition of the great French leaders who understand the grandeur of France and, and its its role in Europe and the world, embody it. Uh, you know, figures like Louis the Fourteenth or Napoleon Bonaparte or uh, his nephew Louis Napoleon. Uh, De Gaulle is definitely in that 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 category. But he rejects the idea of becoming president. Uh, in the Fourth Republic, he he's worried that the Fourth Republic, the presidency, is basically just a figurehead, and to a certain degree, he's right. It's uh, and he doesn't just want to be a head of state; so he wants to actually exert real political influence and lead, kind of like an American president. That was what he had in mind. So he retires to his estate in Eastern France, and he's sort of like this George Washington kind of figure. Uh, you know, someone who, you know, certainly could have been president if he had really pursued it uh, with any vigor and who uh, then sort of retires. You know, it's like, uh, I've done my duty, you know, I, I helped save France from itself uh, and the Germans. And uh, now I'm going to go off and just be a country gentleman, you know, in my state, and, you know. And that's similar to Washington, you know, his return to Mount Vernon and so forth. It, it's definitely a, a parallel there. Uh, but de Gaulle is young enough. And he also believes that there'll be a moment when, you know, history is going to change. It's going to break his way and they're going to need him. And that when that happens, then he will be able to sort of, you know, basically say, look, you know, uh, if, if you need me, if you want me, then, you know, these are my conditions. Meaning that he would want to come back only if he was going to be someone who could exercise real authority, real political leadership. So he's patient. And it will take some time. The Fourth Republic will last from 1946 to 1958, 12 years, and in that time, he is in retirement. Public politically is a period that's it's not really to the credit of France. It's, the governments are, are divided against themselves. The, the, there's not effective leadership um, um, uh, by the various premiers. France is facing a backlash in its vast empire. Decolonization is definitely the way of the future. The French don't want to admit that. They're very sensitive about losing their great power status. They want to somehow recoup that as best they can. But back home, uh, you have a, a really interesting cultural period. I've already mentioned Miles Davis, who comes to Paris first in 1949. I'll come back to him. Uh, but uh, two uh, French authors, uh, Albert Camus is on the left and Jean Passard on the right, become probably the most famous of the uh, writers of the existentialist uh, school. And this is based on this idea that life is essentially absurd. If you think of like, for instance, uh, uh, Beckett's um, you know, Theater of the Absurd, Waiting for, Waiting for Godot would be an example of this in theater. Uh, uh, Camus uh, uh, was someone who, uh, you know, the, the thing that one of the main differences between he and Jean Paul Sartre will be that Camus feels that 
even though life is essentially absurd and that we're, we're not really these independent actors that we believe. However, that didn't mean that you shouldn't take a stand against totalitarianism. Where Sartre was sort of more ambiguous about this in the sense that, well, it's all absurd. So, you know, why bother? Uh, just recognize it for what it is. Camus did not agree. Uh, and he and Sartre will eventually split over, uh, for instance, Stalin. This, you know, uh, Camus will say, look, you know, this guy's a, a murderous monster. And, you know, even though the, I'm supportive of, of the left, I, I, I can't support uh, someone like Stalin. Whereas Jean-Paul Sartre had no problem with that. And Jean-Paul Sartre also was, uh, I don't know, comfortable under Nazi occupation. I don't know exactly. I don't know if that's quite accurate. But, you know, it wasn't uh, necessarily any great inconvenience. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, it, it's a, there's there's this the split in the existentialist movement between these two great writers. I'd recommend reading the novel *The Stranger* by Camus if you want to, if you, if you want to explore the, the sort of the, the essence of ex, existentialism. Uh, you know, alienation, and of course, you know these themes have earlier precedents in the work of people like Dostoevsky and Kafka and so forth. But Conrad, even, but. Uh, Again, the stranger. It's a again, it's a it's a work that's very insightful uh, in terms of an introduction uh, to existentialism. But again, there's this split. Another important figure is Simone de Beauvoir, the uh, philosopher, uh, proto-feminist. She was associated with with Jean Paul Sartre. Uh, her work, The Second Sex. Really groundbreaking in terms of modern feminism. What's interesting is at the time it didn't really get that much traction. So it's not really her generation who she's writing for that is going to be inspired and motivated to act on this. It's really the the next generation who she will associate with. She's gonna she's gonna live a long life and she's gonna be active. Her view essentially was that. Uh, you know, the idea that women had some sort of choice between living more independent, fulfilling lives, um, or if they, you know, being, you know, homemakers and, and mothers and that being fulfilling in and of itself, uh, she felt that that was sort of a false choice that, you know, just by having that second option that made it more difficult for the women that wanted to pursue a career that wanted to um you know uh assert themselves in society uh and it creates a really a it's, it's the beginning of a conversation about women in society women and men marriage child childbirth child rearing women and women uh you know uh and and it's uh you know, it's 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 a it's it's a really important work. Again, more later, you know, during the Fifth Republic than in the Fourth Republic. Uh, but she is such a an important figure. The thing is, it's interesting you know, here in the United States, we're much more familiar with the work of Betty Friedan, uh, the feminine mystique. But that work comes out um, almost a couple decades after uh, the Second Sex. So it's really uh, it's French feminism that initially, anyway, is 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 sort of the, the spearhead, and um, but then American feminism becomes uh, probably the most influential, and they're sort of two tracked uh, in this regard. Uh, some there's, there's been some commentary on this, and uh, uh, different uh, scholars writing about how. Feminism in France and feminism in the United States don't exactly they don't exactly mean the same thing, uh, and again, a lot of this can be traced back to to her work and how it was interpreted in France, and then uh, in the United States.
Charles Davis, uh, uh, he first came to France in 1949, uh, probably the most, the most talented jazz musician arguably the United States has ever produced, both as a performer and as a composer. Uh, and he had a famous affair with the singer and actress Juliette Greco. Uh, and he would return to France uh, throughout the 1950s. As I mentioned earlier, his uh, recording of a soundtrack, essentially as he watched the film uh, Elevated to the Gallows in real time. And then it was recorded, really quite remarkable. Uh, and you know, jazz really is the, the music of this period uh, in, in France. It really, I mean, it, it was influential earlier, uh, you know, during the latter part of World War I into the, certainly in the 1920s, but it, it's, it's, it's this, this newer, modern uh, version of jazz in the 40s and 50s that becomes the soundtrack for, for that period. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the decolonization just becomes this, this very painful uh, experience for France as a country in terms of its national pride, its dignity, grandeur, its sense of being a world power. This is the aftermath of the famous French defeat at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the final decisive battle when the French were defeated in what they called French Indochina or Indochine. Uh, they were defeated by the uh, Viet Minh, the uh, communist Vietnamese forces uh, that wanted the French out. They had fought the Japanese in World War II, and when the French tried to return, uh, they were having none of it. And uh, the army that was at this base, the NBN Fu, it's very similar to the American uh, base at Khe Sanh, uh in 1968. Uh, though in that case, that base held out, it didn't fall. but uh, it's the same idea. You you um, you lay siege to a, a position that has a great symbolic significance to the enemy. You know they'll pour everything into it, and then inflict a uh, decisive defeat on them by capturing that position. Uh, and that's what happened. And the French leave. So this is a, a really it's really sort of coming down in the world, if you will. The reality is, is since World War II, France really hadn't been a world power. It, uh, you know, gave up that mantle really for good in 1940. So that means it has to redefine its role in the world. And that's painful, you know. The British, to their credit, were much better at decolonization. They had, there was a lot of ugly events to associated with decolonization with the British. Uh, certainly after they'd left in South Asia, that would be the worst. But uh, compared to the French, the French experience generally was was more painful. The French, probably because they, they just they just didn't want to let go. They didn't know how to gracefully let go. And it led to defeats like this. They were defeated in Indochine. The war in Algeria breaks out. And this is going to last eight painful years. It's going to rip not just Algerian society apart, but French society apart. For France, this is to them what like the American... For the Americans, the Vietnam War would be later in terms of what it did to their society. Algeria is uh, across the Mediterranean from the south of France. And you have to understand that you know, Algeria was seen by the French, if not the Algerians, as part of France. It was not seen as a colony. It was not seen as, a, as part of imperialism. Uh, Indochina was, but not, not Algeria. Algeria was France. And there were a lot of people of French extraction who lived at the so-called Pas de Noirs, the, the black shoes, uh, who made up the elite of Algeria. But many of them had been there for generations. And this goes back to the um, uh, earlier in the 19th century. Uh, and so they saw themselves as French and Algeria is, is France. The problem was is you had this majority who were uh, Muslim and essentially this sort of they had sort of a second class citizenship inside France technically of course they're all French but that the reality there's you know there's the de jure and then there's the de facto and the de facto was that Muslim Algerians were again like second class citizens and again decolonization the the, the, the mood in the world had shifted 
decisively against imperialism. It's an anachronism. And you have a group, the FLN, that then is formed, and they are going, they're willing to use very savage tactics to get the French to finally leave, to quit, to get out. Uh, but the French really dig in their heels, partly because they've just lost in Indochina, and it's like, now, you know, now what? You know, we're going we're to lose Algeria, you know? So there's the big picture. But then there's focusing in on this idea of also that Algeria is France. Uh, they, 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 they really believe this. Um, so uh, the fighting there is, uh, then it, it'll involve the use of what we would think of as just essentially terrorism by both sides, including the police. The police uh, often were the biggest terrorists. Uh, you know, think about it. You know, the police are the ones who are supposed to protect you from the terrorists. Torture was used as a matter of course. There was execution of innocent people, women and children. Uh, both sides have committed atrocities. There's no, if you're looking for someone who, a side that is, you know, has the moral high ground, at least in terms of atrocities, neither one did. Uh, but the Algerians do have the moral high ground of wanting their independence. They want their own country. They've been a colonized people and uh, they don't want to be second class citizens in their own country anymore. So in that sense, they do occupy the moral high ground. So the film that I showed the movie poster for, example of Cinema Verite, true, you know, truthful film, um, again, it, 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 uh, shortly after the war was over, it, it's released and it sort of documents this. It was pretty painful. This was That, that film was one that the French government was not happy about uh, uh, because it was just too brutally honest. But this war is going to drag on and on and on. And the French are, you know, the, 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 the people in, back in France, back in Paris, are eventually going to start being divided in opinion over it, just like the Vietnam War divided opinion in the United States. So you'll have one side that feels we have to support the military. It's, a, it's going to take, we're going to have, we have to take a firm line. You know, we have to, it might take some harsh actions, but we cannot allow this. We need to, you know, uh, assert our, our rule in Algeria, no matter what. Patriots. On the other side, you have those that say, well, wait a minute, you know, what makes France great? What makes France great is our values. La Cité. You know, this liberal, progressive view, you know, going back to the French Revolution, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité. That's what makes us great. And you know, how great are we if we're, you know, torturing Algerian uh, freedom fighters? Uh, you know, and then of course there's also just the fatigue. You know, who's going to fight this war? Well, it's going to be the, you know, the French, and they have a draft, conscripts. You had to serve. You get your call of papers again, similar to the Americans in the Vietnam War. A lot of people, in, you know, they were not happy about going. And, and, and some of them, of course, never made it back. And their families were not happy about this. Some people made it back and they were not the same again. Even ones that, you know, were physically whole. They had, you know, PTSD or perhaps they had done, you know, been asked to torture someone and done something that they couldn't live with. I mean, it, it was a lot of this. And so there was this fatigue with it. And it also was costly and money. And just in the way it eroded France, France's image in the world. So there's various factors why people would oppose it, but it really does divide the country. And by the late 50s, you see a shift more and more towards let's just get an agreement that we can live with um, and we need to get out. Uh, now, if it's a majority, it's a slim majority. Uh, and it's certainly not a majority among the, the people of French extraction in Algeria. Who are the, the hardest of the hardcore, um, but there is this shift uh, that's happening by the late fifties. The government, of course, is perceptive, perceives this. But what happens is is that there is a, essentially a, a, a coup d'état or a push. It starts in Algeria among the army there, and then spreads to Paris. So it's sort of like the tail wagging the dog. 
and it's going to topple the Fourth Republic. And there's going to be a new government, new constitution. This is called the Treze Mai, 1958, 13th of May. Uh, what the supporters of the war in Algeria were hoping for, they essentially got, which was they were hoping for the Fourth Republic, which seemed to be wavering about the war to end and a new republic to be formed and that that republic would be led by Charles de Gaulle, who's this ultra-nationalist patriot, military, career military guy, believes in French grandeur. He's exactly the guy that they want. If they could pick anybody, you know, it would, it would be him. He's, you know, if we could just get de Gaulle, then we could deal with all of these naysayers. And on top of it, the Fifth Republic's constitution is going to have a presidency written, basically tailor-made for de Gaulle, exactly what he wanted, which is this very strong, almost you know, king-like presidency, uh, with term, you know, with terms that are actually longer than American presidents' terms. Um, and this gives, puts him in a position where it's, he's certainly not a dictator, but he's certainly stronger than any other elected president um, in a democratic country. It gives him great authority. So he comes in now, he's, he, he, his time is now to come save France again from itself. Um, you know, sort of like George Washington coming back from, you know, Mount Vernon to, to, uh, uh, to Philadelphia to, you know, help with the writing of a new constitution, and, you know, it's a similar kind of thing. Uh, and uh, so that calms down the, the, the army the pro-war crowd. Uh, and because of de Gaulle's stature, uh, he's accepted as uh, the, the leader of the new republic. Uh, he's seen as somebody who has shown that he's willing to step away from power, and that's important in terms of people being willing to trust him. But de Gaulle is also ultimately a realist. And when he does his homework and really gets an understanding of the military situation in Algeria, he reaches the conclusion that the war is, is not winnable. Uh, it's similar to the conclusion that some American officials reached very early on in the, the period that led to the Vietnam War. Unfortunately, uh, they did not carry the day or they were not they didn't speak up enough. Uh, but de Gaulle decides to reach out to the FLN secretly and start talking to them. It has to be very secret because they're both sticking their necks out and they both have hard line, hardcore, uh, you know, types uh, that would love to sabotage this. They, you know, they want to win at all costs, whether it's the French side or the Algerian side. But de Gaulle, uh, again, has great stature and it's very important. And ultimately, he's able to reach an agreement in front of one of front page of one of France's most important dailies, Le Figaro. It announces that there's going to be an agreement. This will be called the Evian Accords uh, when they meet at the spa town of Evian, and they'll be finally concluded in 1962, which will ultimately lead to the end of the war and Algerian independence. Many of the Pad Noirs, of course, they're not willing to live under majority Muslim rule, and they leave. They go back to France. They're going to be a source of trouble for de Gaulle, unsurprisingly. But it does end this war, this ugly, ugly, painful, costly war. Uh, he is blamed, of course, by the hardliners. He's seen as a, you know, this Judas figure, this traitor, this Benedict Arnold, who stabbed us in the back. So they're not going to forget this. However, for the rest of the country that it still believes in a, an important national, even world destiny for France, an independent destiny, not as some sort of American satellite, he then has something to offer. Uh, 
and that is the successful tests of nuclear weapons in the desert in Algeria at Hagan in 1960 and 1961. Uh, and this is really important politically in French history. I can't emphasize this enough. The, the successful nuclear program, nuclear weapons program. Uh, so for again, for nationalists that aren't like absolute hardcore supporters of the war, this is again, giving them something. Okay, we, we're, we've lost in Algeria, we have, to, we have to get out, but we have nuclear weapons. So we're one of the nuclear, you know, nuclear powers along with that, that would, at that time, that would have been the US, the Soviet Union and Britain had nuclear weapons at that point. And now the French would. And so we are, you know, it's our, so we're making a statement here, uh, technologically, militarily, strategically. Uh, and again, this was something very popular uh, uh, with nationalists or even just people who wanted France to have sort of an independent destiny from a U.S. sort of uh, hegemonic uh, world. And it's very impressive, you know, because there are other countries that now have nuclear weapons. Uh, China eventually develop one, develops one. Uh, the Israelis, uh, and then later India and Pakistan uh, will develop nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, North Korea, I believe, now has nuclear weapons. Uh, certainly doesn't create a more stable world, but but anyway, that you know, so it has spread. But one of the things that's interesting is that if you look at all of the nuclear weapons programs around the world, they all come from two different sort of roots. Most of the nuclear weapons programs around the world go back to the American, the original American program. There were Soviet spies in that program. And that then led to them developing their weapon. Britain didn't need spies because Britain because of its quote unquote special relationship with the United States, which France resented, was assisted by the United States to develop their own nuclear weapons capability. So that was a friendly sharing. In the case of China, again, it was espionage. They were able to have, have a spy in the program. They, they took that information and eventually developed their own nuclear weapons. And then the others, the, for instance, the uh, for instance Pakistan and then North Korea, this the, the, the spreads the root of it goes back to the United States. But the French developed it completely on their own, A to Z. So in other words, they're the only country other than the United States to do it A to Z. And then they then shared it with the Israelis. So that's how the Israelis got their nuclear weapon. But that, so that's impressive. You know, in other words, in many ways, they're still saying that we're still the country of, you know, uh, you know Pierre and Marie, you know, uh, Curie, for instance, you know, who, of course, were the, some of the first to work with radioactive materials and such. And, um, so it's a, it's an important, uh, statement. They're kind of useless because the United, you know, the, the United States essentially with its massive nuclear force through NATO essentially guarantees the security of, of Western Europe. So that, and that includes France. So in terms of them as a, as a, some sort of military, having some sort of military purpose. It's really show. So it's more political, the purpose. Uh, a policy that France has called tous azimuts. It's multiple coordinates. In other words, the French will then say, our nuclear missiles, we don't have a lot of them, but we have enough. Are we have coordinates, you know, we plot the coordinates where we would fire the missiles, pre, you know, set to be aimed at, you know, Moscow, Leningrad, you know, it's the Cold War. But we also have missiles plotted to be fired at Washington, D.C. and New York. Now, again, this is, to a large degree, it's really just show that these weapons are not going to be used. They're, but it's something that's very important in French politics because it nuclear weapons enable the French right, who's very you know, generally gung ho and nationalistic, and they want a strong military, uh, 
We have nuclear weapons. We stand up to the Reds. But also the French left that doesn't like this, you know, U.S. cultural imperialism, U.S. hegemony, right? They like that. So it's one of the few things that the French political right and the French political left, as the 20th century sort of you know, goes on, it's one of the few things that they can agree on is nuclear weapons. Remarkable. But that's really their purpose. It's a, it's a political purpose. And it shows that France is still cutting edge and it's still independent. De Gaulle, though, has to deal with the OAS, the, the Secret Army Organization. Uh, they make multiple attempts to assassinate him. It's remarkable that he didn't get didn't get killed. They had one in particular that almost succeeded. It was it was a very close run thing. They never did get him. It's remarkable considering how many attempts were made. The French military, French police, they they're savage in their repression of the OAS. Uh, the kind of methods that were used against Algerian uh, freedom fighters, the FLN, are now used against the OAS, torture, uh, all kinds of awful things to try to crush them. It's pretty savage. By the late 1960s, de Gaulle is dealing with a new world. It's not so much decolonization and uh, the OAS, it's the counterculture revolution. It's this new generation, this generation that's grown up in pretty much an affluence. Uh, you know, if you look at the counterculture revolution and you look at that generation, whether it's in France or it's in the United States or elsewhere, there's a real generation gap there because their parents are the they're the people who lived through the Depression and fought the war and lived through the Holocaust. And, and then, of course, in Europe, the rebuilding after the war, you know, come, building out of the rubble. But their kids, you know, they're the most comfortable generation in European history. They, uh, they, they have everything, essentially. Uh, also, they have access to education, particularly post-secondary education that parents can only have dreamed of, most of their parents anyway. Uh, so then why are they so ticked off? You see the paving blocks, these paving blocks being dug up in, in Parisian streets and thrown at the police, um, and the militia. Uh, there's a long tradition of this that goes back to the 19th century, you know, the July Revolution and whatnot. Uh, so this is a new generation sort of, you know, digging up the same blocks to, to throw at the same enemy. Uh, well, what, all, what, what originally happened, what, what caused it all to boil over, there were a couple of things. First of all, there was a lot of labor agitation. And without the, the solidarity that the unions, the working men showed with the students, and again, they didn't have that much in common with them. I mean, the working men, these were blue collar types, you know, more middle aged types. And then you had these young, essentially spoiled uh, college kids, but they actually showed solidarity. And that was very important. And, a lot of the changes, if, if labor hadn't shown solidarity with them, um, it could have been a different outcome. But anyway, what, so there's, there's labor agitation, but with the students, there were a number of, of, of things that eventually triggered this, really just a revolt in the streets. If, if you look at what's happening in the United States, uh, as I speak in June of 2020, uh, again, those protests are about something different in terms of the specific details, but the general thrust among young people in urban areas uh, is very similar. It's dissatisfaction with the status quo uh, that, you know, we need to be heard. So in that sense, it's similar. And of course, it's not confined just to Paris. 68, you see, um, you see protests, riots, you know, from, from Prague in the east all the way to Berkeley, California in the west. Um, so again, the, the, what happened was, was that as the college, the university system expanded, in France, so the Sorbonne, for instance, the largest university in the world, Paris, but they had other campuses and they essentially built these sort of all purpose, soulless, uh, campuses and dormitories for this 
generation of students who were going to college, oftentimes the first you know generation in their families to go to college, and they were just simply overcrowded. There was severe sort of housing shortage or space shortage in student housing. That really was the main trigger. And then there were other aspects. So one of them was the fact that back then, after a certain curfew hour, you know, you couldn't, if you were a female, you couldn't be in a male dormitory. Or if you were a male, you couldn't be in a female dormitory. And uh, this is a generation, the counterculture revolution generation, where they have much more liberal uh, views about premarital sex, uh, among other things. Also, recreational drug use is, is something that's spreading at this time. And they see that as an affront to their, themselves as autonomous adults, albeit young adults, but adults. And they are. You know, you should be able to, you know, uh, be with who you want to be with in, in your room. It's, you know, there shouldn't be these, uh, these you know, old fashioned uh, rules that there was an affront to them as independent adults. Uh, so that's another aspect of it. Um, and then it, oh, actually there were a couple of other cultural um, uh, components. And then ultimately there's this figure named Daniel Cohn-Bendy who uh, he was, I think, a German, French, Jewish extraction, and he was uh, somebody who was uh, fairly vocal, and he ultimately is targeted by university officials because of his his status in terms of his citizenship status. Like, I, 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 I can't remember the exact details, but it was along those lines, and they were going to basically send him back to Germany. But the idea was that you know, we need to rally around Daniel Cohn-Bendy, that this police state is 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 persecuting him because he spoke out and because he's Jewish, right? And and they they want to they want to you know get rid of him. Uh, uh, during those years. Uh, so, uh, again, there's a number of factors, but then it's just an explosion uh, on the streets. Uh, it, it, it's, you know, there's, there's, there's before 68 and there's after 68. France, Europe, they're, they're not going to be the same uh, after this. Young women are a big part of this. Uh, you know, they're, they're fully involved with the counterculture revolution, uh, and they want more autonomy. They want respect. Ultimately, this will lead to uh, a campaign to legalize abortion in France, which, again, is still nominally a Catholic country at that time. Uh, and it'll be a very public campaign. The argument being that women need to have control over their own bodies. The state has no right to tell them what to do with their own bodies, and that ultimately that that's what abortion is. It's a decision about the, the, the reproduction of, of a woman's body, and that the woman, you know, as, as an independent adult individual, has the right to make these decisions. Uh, but you know, there's, it, it's again, it's it, there's a lot going on here uh it's a real stew and to some degree it's contradictory if you if you if you look into 68 deeper I mean, usually most most times in history books it's rather superficial um there's, there's there's a lot of contradictory strands um to what the the youth wanted the labor movement and if you look behind there's a banner behind uh the women marching, it says the CGT, that's one of the most important unions, if not the most important union in France. So they have their own agenda. And then there's also a divide to some degree between men and women. Um, you know, many of the men who were the most uh, truculent in their demands and confronting the government and confronting society were, you know, essentially really sexist and, you know, male chauvinist pigs. They, you know, they, they thought that, uh, Women were, uh, you know, uh, socially were, were, you know, romantically were, 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 were fun to be with. And that, you know, that, that was something that should be allowed. But they weren't necessarily interested in what women had to say as leaders um, in terms of the counterculture movement. So that will lead to, to rifts as well.
Uh, but it is an important moment uh, in terms of feminism. And it's interesting because Simone de Beauvoir, of course, is not part of this generation, but ultimately she will connect with some of the leaders, feminist leaders that come out of this generation uh, to move towards, for instance, legalization of abortion. In the 70s, uh, after de Gaulle retired, and de Gaulle to a large degree is, you know, he's not toppled by the events of 68 in, in a, necessarily a direct way, but the reality is, is that um, his vision for France and the confidence of the French people in him leading the country forward are greatly shaken by the events of 68. And he's not able to really recover politically from what happens in, in the spring of 68. And he ultimately forces uh, sort of a political showdown with his opponents uh, to try to reassert his authority. And it sort of basically it blows up in his face. And just, I, I guess, really for his own dignity, he decides to step aside. And he dies actually soon thereafter. It's like his moment in history is, is gone. Um, but the the presidents that replace him, uh, Pompidou and uh, Giscard d'Estaing, they, they're similar. They're from the same, what's called the Gaullist Party. It's sort of a center-right nationalist party. Uh, and they're, they're not really outstanding figures in, in French history. They're sort of caretakers through that period. Uh, but in the early 80s, you see Francois Mitterrand, uh, come into power. He's a socialist. He's of the left. And there was a, a lot of concern that, you know, would, how would the left govern if it ever had power? Would they be responsible? I mean, keep in mind that, you know, since the Fifth Republic has been founded in 1958, it's had only uh, conservative center-right leadership. So Mitterrand was a, sort of a boogeyman, a scary figure for a lot of, a lot of people in France. Uh, and when he comes in, he allays a lot of those fears by taking a more moderate position. It's not that he's not pushing progressive reform, particularly on women's rights and women's inclusion in politics by law. This is something that eventually will bear a lot of fruit. Uh, and also, he's you know his support is strong with the union, so their interests are, are foremost. But in general, there's not a radical shift left. Uh, and that's important. There's more continuity than change. And that allows the Fifth Republic to not go the way of, say, the Fourth Republic. Uh, you know, it, it looks like once Mitterrand, and he'll be president for quite a long time, uh, uh, he'll be there multiple terms, that, you know, after after Mitterrand, once this the left has taken power and it wasn't the end of the world, essentially, uh, and there's continuity and there's more things that unite the French than divide them. As you get toward the latter part of the 20th century, it looks like the Fifth Republic is really going to be successful, successful in a way that none of the other republics uh, ever were, because France now, again, there's more. There's more that, that, that unite the French than divide them, and there's there's a sense of sort of continuity with the left and right, that there are significant differences, but not so much that the country's going to become this fractured, polarized, you know, place where, where you have you know, ugly confrontations going on in the streets. Uh, <clears throat> when Mitterrand retires, uh, he'll eventually be replaced. Uh, by another center-right politician. But again, there's not this drastic shift. Uh, and as you get into the 21st century, again, it, it seems like the, the Fifth Republic it seems to have found the answers. And again, part of that goes back to what I had mentioned about the nuclear weapons program, uh, that being one of the first things that enabled the left and the right to, to sort of bury the hatchet. Okay, and, that, and that goes back, gosh, the, that had, you know, the hatchet, so to speak, that goes back to the French Revolution, for crying out loud. This has deep roots, 1789. But by the beginning of the 21st century, it looked like 
they had finally found the, you know, the secret sauce, you know, to make it, it work. But there were deep socioeconomic, uh, systemic problems underneath that that weren't being paid attention to. And this is a legacy of colonization. Because what happened is, is that a lot of people during period of colonization, and as a legacy of that, migrated to France for economic opportunity. And initially they're welcome. The French were confident that their society, last day, could embrace everyone. It's one of the reasons why Miles Davis loved France, because the fact that he was black was just irrelevant. Uh, it was like a breath of fresh air. Uh, and so you had uh, people coming from North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and, and pr pretty large numbers. Um, but what happened is, is that somewhere there in the latter 20th century, early 21st century, the ability, the willingness, however you want to term it, of French society to really embrace and and assimilate or maybe a better way to put it is sort of just to convince the new arrivals of the the desirability of 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 this, this sort of french way of of living the french sort of the secular french worldview seems to have just you know that it it, uh, it it just wasn't taken seriously enough i think it, it, you know that there was they, 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 they couldn't, they, they, they somehow couldn't manage it anymore. Again, whether it was because they were just overwhelmed or because they just, they just lack the, the energy to do it. I don't really know. I mean, I, I, this is a larger question about French society. It's one that they're still trying to answer. Uh, but what happened was, was you started to have essentially urban uh, ghettos uh, to use a, a U.S. term, um, uh, near the big cities. Paris, in particular, is an example of this, that you have the Paris that everybody knows, the Paris the tourists go to, but <clears throat> in a ring, not exactly a full circle, but more or less a ring around the city are these, quote-unquote, suburbs, but they're not suburbs in the sense we think of them in the United States, you know, like Long Island or, you know, the Valley out in California. Again, more like urban ghettos, and they're they're disconnected from the city center. Uh, the famous Paris Metro, I mean, it intentionally was never built to these neighbors because they didn't want to make it easy for the people that live there to come into the city. And these are generally people of color. Many of them are of Muslim extraction, and they feel alienated. Many of them from French society, that they're not really a part of it. There's not necessarily an economic future. Uh, and this is visceral, you know, this is visceral. And, you know, when, when you go to Paris, if you keep your eyes open and you, and you're paying attention, you'll see it, you'll feel it. Uh, and it, it's something that, uh, it, it's going to present serious challenges to the fifth Republic. Again, at the very time when it looked like they had sort of worked it out, the left and the right anyway. The most famous expression of this was just the explosion of rage in the suburbs. Uh, uh, Clichy Soubois is probably the most famous of this. This was in 2005 when Nicolas Sarkozy, another center-right president, was president. And he saw himself as a law and order type of guy. And uh, What happened was, was that there were two uh, youths who, um, when they... In a lot of these neighborhoods, when they see the police, they they see it as a it's a confrontation, automatically a confrontational relationship. They don't see the police as being there, you know, to protect them. They see the police as being there to, uh, you know, sort of uh, persecute them, if you will, to control them. And and so that you know that when they when they see the police, it's you know get out of there. You know that's the first reaction. But of course, running 
it's not such a good idea because then that just then if you're the police you're looking well, why are those two kids running they must have done something and so there's a lot of that uh and so what happened was these two these two young guys uh in their early teens they're running they're trying to hide from the police and they went into an electric like a, a power generator like, a, like an electric station you know um around you know like hot wires and to try to get away from the police who they thought were chasing them and the police of course thought that they were had done something because why would they run anyway what happened was was that one of them was electrocuted and died and the other one uh received severe burns and this one event just it, it just triggered an explosion of rage in these these suburbs uh and they burned and it was a it was a really jarring event for the french because it forced them to have to face something that they they you know they didn't really want to have to face uh you know they they didn't understand why the migrants were so angry they didn't understand why they weren't, you know, grateful to be in this, you know, progressive place called France. Uh, you know, they they pointed a lot of fingers at politicians. You know, why is it that the, you know, there's no economic or educational opportunities for for young people? Um, but it was a it was it was a very tough moment for France uh, because there are now divisions um, that are going to open up again. And the left-right divide is going to, uh, uh, that seemed to be healed, is now going to become pronounced again over the period, really from the riots at clichy sur and other suburbs up through the middle of the last decade. What will happen is, is that many of the uh, young people in the suburbs will then become radicalized uh, uh the internet certainly plays a role in this uh, uh and you know you look at organizations like al-qaeda earlier in the 21st century and then there was isis uh, and others they are tapping into an audience uh among uh, the migrant community that feels alienated and angry uh they want to feel empowered uh and the enemy for them then is you know is, is right there in france i don't necessarily even need to go to uh, some other country that you know to, to fight the enemy uh, uh, and so they act out on this um, and there are a number of famous uh, terrorist attacks that happen in a period of a couple of years that really shake up uh france and paris so first there was the attack on the satirical publication charlie hebdo which by the way you know their you know their 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 attacks their satire was pretty harsh i mean this was not light fair but uh what happened is government went in there and they they felt that they'd been uh, disrespectful to islam and they just started shooting it up and at the same time you had attacks on uh there was a jewish deli for instance uh so you have this anti-semitism uh, that's going to rear its head uh, very publicly in this attack. And then later that same year, there's attacks in Paris itself. There was a rock concert that was attacked. There were cafes. Of course, the Parisians in particular love the the ability to, you know, sort of, you know, the, the line between the street and the, the, the cafe. It's all sort of, you know, part of their, their way, of, way of life, their way of socializing. Um, and they're just easy targets. And it was, it was, uh, terrible. Over uh, 130 people were, were murdered. Uh, and it, you know, so, you know, it's sort of like the, the, the chickens of, so to speak, of, of the Clichy sous bois, uh, the riots now, all this sort of coming home to roost, so to speak, to use that expression, in the sense that that generation's now radicalized and now they're, they have this ideology not just simply anger, and then they're acting out on it. And sometimes it just takes one person, like what happened in Nice the following year in the south of France. You know, you had a um, an area full of people promenading, just walking, 
and someone had a truck and they just drove through all the people and they killed 84 people. It's similar to the attack that happened um, outside um, uh, Stuyvesant High School uh, in 2017. Uh, though fortunately, there were less people that lost their lives in that, that particular attack. Uh, and so, again, so this question of immigration, this question of people coming from societies that have a different worldview um, and their ability to or not to and or their willingness to or not to essentially assimilate into this larger secular French society, La Cité. This really is, is a tough moment for France. And it, to some degree, it's still, it's still living through this. And also particularly for, for Jews, because uh, you know, France, of course, has this ugly history of anti-Semitism. So that, that predates the, the immigrants' arrival. Um, but then with a lot of uh, immigrants coming from predominantly Muslim countries, some of them radicalized. Um, they're bringing an, 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 another variant, a very strong variant of anti-Semitism to France and acting on it. Uh, and a lot of Jews, who are a relatively small minority in France, as they've, they've always been, are feeling increasingly under threat. Uh, you know, Jewish neighborhoods and such, uh, feeling, you know, the, you know, there's, a, you know, anything could happen. Uh, and some of it is just, you know, you have like. Uh, people being mugged or uh, assaulted, sexually assaulted, uh, uh, in some cases then murdered. Um, so it's it's crime, but it's it's not necessarily terrorism. It's but really there's a you know they're targeted because they're Jewish. So it's this is this fine line, you know. And then you know I, I can think of it uh, in my own experience uh, in Paris, La Mahay, which is this really fun neighborhood full of you know, great restaurants, a lot of falafel restaurants and boutiques. It's, it's now more of like a, it's become more of like a hip upscale gay neighborhood, but traditionally it's the Jewish quarter. And so that, that's one of the reasons why there's so many great falafel restaurants. But uh, I remember being there in 2015 and then back again in 2018 and you know, if if you look, you could see the security presence. I mean, I remember there was one uh, Orthodox Jewish school that it, I walked by the gate, and there were these. You know, it wasn't like they just had security guards. You know, they they had like paratroopers with these these guns that were some of the biggest guns I have ever seen. Um, uh, fortunately, they were pointed down at the ground, <laughs> but the you know it was it was kind of it it made you think. You know, what what's the threat out there that's so great that you would need this? Well. And so one of the things that's happened then is that the far right in France, which was so discredited by Vichy, has slowly but surely started to creep back into the national dialogue as a serious political force. And it has to do with this, this question about immigrants or children of immigrants, suburbs, radicalization, ideology, anti-Semitism, and it's now creating this, this, this widening rift again. In the 2017 election, Emmanuel Macron started a new centrist, political, business-friendly movement, a young guy, and he's going to win handily, as you'll see here, uh, the election for president over Marine Le Pen, who was the sort of the inheritor of the Far right National Front from her father, who was this uh, sort of a, basically a fringe figure in French uh, French political life. He was a Holocaust denier. He was he was kind of a, a nut. Um, but she takes over, and she's much more slick and sophisticated um, in terms of her message and her sort of branding, uh, trying to make connections with other populist right wing uh, political movements and alliances and such. And what's interesting here is not that she got, uh, you know, she didn't have a, she, she wasn't even close to beating Macron, but that she was able to get to that point because the way that the French uh, presidential elections work is that uh, 
unless someone in the initial elections wins a majority outright, then the two that had the most votes uh, then run against each other, which means that she did better than the establishment center-right candidates, you know, the, the inheritors of the tradition of Charles de Gaulle. And that was pretty shocking. Uh, and part of her message, uh, besides being a nationalist uh, uh, and, and a populist, is an anti-immigrant, which is sometimes seen as an anti-Muslim, even racist message uh, that essentially, if you can't become French, then you should leave kind of, you know, that, that essentially is the, the gist of it. Um, that, you know, uh, th that there's a certain sort of set of values and so forth. Uh, but she also is somebody who then has also tried to position herself as a champion of the country's Jews. That, you know, unlike the left or the center left who won't admit that the overwhelming majority of attacks, then attacks that are increasing um, on Jews are by young disaffected Muslim men, I'm going to say it like it is, and, you know, I'm going to do something about it, if you like me. She's kind of vague about what she's going to do exactly, I guess. But, you know, essentially that she's positioning herself as the one person who's calling it like it is in terms of violence by Muslims against Jews in France, and that something has to be done about it, and that it has to be recognized, that you can't, you know, uh, not talk about it because it's seen as too politically sensitive um, to say something like that. And that resonates with a lot of the country's Jews. And it's interesting because you have people who formerly would have been on the left politically, uh, now switching their allegiance to this party whose founder was a Holocaust denier for crying out loud. Uh, it's remarkable. But again, she did not have the kind of support that she had hoped for in this election. She did more poorly than she thought she was going to do. On the other hand, you know, 34 percent of uh, you know the population of a big country voted for her. Um, and when you consider how you know racist a lot of her views are, again, a lot of it sort of veiled and you know sort of more sophisticated language than her father. But that's troubling. Uh, so you can look at it and say, well, you know, uh, the forces of you know the progressive forces won, but uh, you know, there's a, it, it's not all together. A, uh, the, 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 the jury is still out in terms of French politics um, and where it's ultimately going to, to go. And then under Macron, you have, of course, the yellow vests. Uh, you know, this is similar to some degree to 68, though to a large degree, what's been happening um, with these protests lasted really months. We're not talking about days or weeks here. Is essentially that the, the yellow vest, everybody's supposed to have one of these in their car so that if you have to stop, you know, because you run out of gas or you have to fix your car or something, you can put the vest on so you'll be seen. It's, but essentially it's like, and what it means, since everybody has it by wearing it, it's like every man. So that's the idea of the yellow vest. So we're like every man, we're the forgotten man kind of thing. Um, and it's about his economic policies, which they see as favoring the wealthy and, uh, uh, you know, international business. And they're breaking down sort of the social contract in France, which essentially prioritizes um, workers' rights and, and standard of living, and quality of living, even if it means it's not the most efficient or profitable way to go. Uh, and that's really the core of it. Though there's been talk that there's agents provocateurs, meaning people on the right, people who come from groups like the, the, the National Front or groups that are even more far to the right, who get involved um, to just cause mayhem to try to discredit Macron, to try to make it look like the country's you know, becoming ungovernable. Therefore, you need a strong leader like Marine Le Pen to come in and, you know. So there's definitely been Talk, much talk of this. That there's a, you know, so it's both principled sort of uh, socioeconomic uh, protest by people who feel left behind by these 
these sort of pro-business policies mixed in with people who might be there just to, you know, cause trouble, uh, to make things unstable. One bit of really good news in recent years in France was the national team's success in the Soccer World Cup in Russia in the summer of 2018 and the rise of this fantastic star Mbappe, who reminds many of sort of a taller, lankier version of Pelé when he was young. Magnificent talent. The whole team, which was also very racially and ethnically diverse, um, was fantastic. Uh, they pretty much dominated the World Cup right from, from A to Z. Uh, and the country was very excited by this. Les Blues, because they were the blue jerseys. Uh, so this was something that, you know, again, it, it, it something France needed uh, after uh, the, you know, the, uh, the divide, this, the, the reopening of this right-left uh, divide. Then, of course, there was the, the, the fire in Notre Dame last spring in 2019. The, the, these images really uh, uh, made people very emotional. Notre Dame seems just this timeless place. You know, it's hard to imagine that something like this could happen. I remember walking around the, the cathedral, uh, taking pictures with a friend, right there where the flying buttresses are, you know, that you look up at the spire and you just think it's, it's always been there and always will be. Uh, and you know, the, the actually, you know, the, the, the fire was so intense that uh, if it wasn't for the efforts, the heroic efforts of, of Parisian firemen, uh, the whole thing could have come down. They lost a lot of the original building, but the whole thing could have come down. It was that close. But they're working on repairing it. And I think that to a large degree, I think that this is something that might also be a unifying force, not so much because of it's a Catholic institution, but because it's of its cultural and historical significance in the city of Paris and the country of France. People can rally around this. Uh, and the rebuilding is going to take a long time. But the rebuilding of France in terms of its society also is probably going to take a long time. Because demographically, France has changed. Uh, it is not the same country in terms of its racial and ethnic composition as it was, say, in the liberation of Paris in 1944. And so France has to figure out how to make that work for everybody. Uh, because if they can't, uh, it could lead to really one of two things. Just uh, continued unrest. Uh, and, uh, you know, racial ethnic divisions and playing themselves out in the streets. Uh, another wave of terror attacks, perhaps. Or it could lead to the rise of a populist right wing government. Uh, and that could be even worse. But that remains to be seen. I'm hopeful because I'm a big fan of France. So until next time. Salut.